Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to our introduction to the sonnet. We got cut off in Monday's Zoom, so we're going to spend some time here in this mini lecture working through what we didn't get to cover, or at least some of what we didn't get to cover. Um, Monday's Zoom class, we spent a little bit of time with Edna St. Vincent Millay's What Lips My Lips Have Kissed and Where and Why. Uh, a little with Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day? Uh, and we got cut off right in the middle of Michael Drayton's Since There's No Help, Come, Let Us Kiss and Part. Today, I want to finish up with Drayton and work us through John Milton's When I Consider How My Light is Spent. Uh, I'm not going to deal with Spencer. You can read him and see for yourself with reference to the diagram that I posted for you in the Files tab on Populi. Uh, you can see with that poem and with, with reference to the diagram what Spencerian form is all about. Um, I'm also not going to deal with John Donne here. Um, John Donne is so much fun. But he's a member of a special club that we call the metaphysical poets. And the metaphysical poets are uh, basically defined by their investment in really elaborate conceits. Their, their poems are just these thick forests of concept and subtle, subtle device in their particular um, approaches to sonnet construction. Um, Dunn's work is not particularly difficult to understand at the basic level, like to, to know what he's saying, but to, to penetrate the real philosophical weight of his work, um, and particularly to appreciate how he uses subtle poetic choices, punctuation, line breaks, things like that, in order to reinforce his argument, um, it's just like, oh, we could spend a whole class just on John Donne. Uh, and we can. We can spend time on John Donne if anybody wants that. By all means, you know, do, do contact me and say, I'm completely in love with the Holy Sonnets. Please, can we talk about them? I would love nothing more than that. But for this sort of, you know, recap to, to kind of get done with what we, we tried to cover in class, um, I'm just going to say, if you didn't read the Donne poems that were signed last week, read them, read them, read them, read them. They are beautiful. Um, here we're going to focus on uh, Drayton and Milton and, and call it a day. Um, this video, we're going to focus on basic interpretation of content uh, and secondarily on finding the turn in each of these sonnets, that point where the attitude, the argument, uh, the approach of the poem shifts and takes us from here to there. It brings us to a different place. To start, though, uh, I wanted to say that I reviewed Monday's Zoom video and I caught myself committing a cardinal sin. I caught myself a couple of times ascribing gender to figures of the poem. We don't do this, guys. I, um, I called the beloved in Sonnet 18, she... Uh, because this poem is so often used as kind of like the wooing poem, um, often directed at a woman. But there's actually no clear indicator in the text who this beloved is. And in point of historical fact, things I know that I can tell you, scholars believe Shakespeare wrote Sonnet 18 for a young boy in praise of his beauty, because that was a perfectly normal thing to notice and to speak of at the time. Uh, in Michael Drayton's poem, also, I accidentally called the speaker he or him because, for whatever reason, I imagined the speaker as a man. Um, maybe I was relating the, the thoughts expressed by the speaker to, to someone I know. Uh, but again, there's nothing in the poem to say who the speaker is. So, learn by my example. Do not do as I do. It's very important to check your assumptions when reading poetry, when reading anything. Um, many poems address themselves to somebody. So there's a speaker and a spoken to, often a beloved or somebody the poet's really mad at, you know. Um, just be careful about ascribing gender or, or any other sort of assumption about the, the personage of, of who you're looking at on either side. 
just because the author of the poem is male doesn't mean the speaker of the poem is necessarily male, uh, or that an addressed beloved is female, so on and so forth. There you are. Cautionary word. Um, okay, let's finish what we started with my dear Michael Drayton. I'll read the poem over one more time just to get us into the flow. Since there's no help, come, let us kiss and part. Nay, I have done, you get no more of me. And I am glad, yea, glad with all my heart, that thus so cleanly I myself can free. Shake hands forever, cancel all our vows, and when we meet at any time again, be it not seen in either of our brows, that we one jot of former love retain. Now, at the last gasp of love's latest breath, when his pulse is failing, passion speechless lies. When faith is kneeling by his bed of death and innocence is closing up his eyes, now, if thou wouldst, when all have given him over from death to life, thou mightst him yet recover. I don't know what wedding ceremonies were like in Elizabethan England. I haven't done research on that. Um, but I believe the kiss, the sacred kiss that bride and groom share is pretty old. That's a pretty ancient convention. And isn't it just awful how that marriage kiss gets twisted around here to become the kiss of parting in the, in the beginning? Same in line five. Shake hands forever. Cancel all our vows. Couples join hands at the altar when they get married, but this handshake, this very calm and dignified sign of a sort of gentleman's agreement, is the touch whereby the speaker and spoken to agree to stop belonging to each other. This pattern plays out through both of the first quatrains. First, images of touching, this lingering sort of heartbroken tenderness, and then a switch to coldness and remoteness. Come, let us kiss and part. Thank God I can so cleanly free myself from this arrangement. Shake hands forever. Then let neither of our faces show one trace of former love. And at the beginning of the third quatrain, there's a little shift in tone. The speaker dives into metaphor almost enough to make you wonder whether we should read this as written in an octave and a sestet. Is, is this the turn? This, this turn to metaphor? Let's, let's see. Now at the last gasp of love's latest breath. Um, latest here means closest to the end. Sometimes when, when we talk about latest, the latest thing, uh, we mean it's recent in a way that makes it cutting edge. It sort of points to the future. But here, latest very much means near the end of something. It, it implies an approaching conclusion. Like when people talk about the latter days before Christ's return. In this third quatrain, there are four personified figures. Love, passion, faith, and innocence. And they all get capital letters and are, are treated like characters. So when the speaker talks about he or him in this section, which of those four figures do you think the speaker is talking about? And how do we account for the other three? What, what's the relationship between these figures? I think that love is the dying figure. Love is the, the he, him being discussed, the sort of object of the scene. Um, and I think passion is perhaps a companion to love, like love's wife, who lies beside him in the bed and holds his hand and watches him dying and just can't speak. It's almost like passion can't imagine living, can't imagine going on after love is dead. And that, I mean, when you just put it through your own human emotional logic, that kind of sounds right, doesn't it? Somebody who isn't in love can go around being passionate, willy-nilly, getting laid or whatever, and, and think nothing of it. 
somebody who has been deeply in love and who loses that love, they might find themselves feeling that there, there's nothing equal for them after this, that passion becomes exactly empty. What about those other two figures, faith and innocence? I imagine them in the way that the, the poem sort of arranges them in the scene. I imagine them almost like the two priests or, or clergy attending on the dying man, like praying for his soul. Um, love is lying in the bed, near death. Faith is kneeling by his bedside, maybe saying the last rites. Even faith itself has given love up for dead. Faith has no faith left that love can survive this, this extremis. And innocence is closing up his eyes, closing, closing love's lids. Innocence is leaning over the dead man and shutting his eyes forever. What a flippin' image. Just the very phrase, we think about wide-eyed innocence, that's completely undone here. Innocence itself, that looks with bright hope at anything and everything, is closing the dead love's eyes. Final couplet. Now, even now, if thou wouldst, and this is the original speaker of the poem again, coming back, speaking to the beloved, about to, to go away forever. Even now, he says, if you wanted to, when all have given him over, meaning love, everyone has given love up for dead, from death to life, thou mightst him yet recover. You can still save us, the speaker says. If I'm really, really honest, he says, I still love you. I still love you with my whole heart. And if you wanted to love me back, we could make a go of this together. Well, that's a turn, too. I mean, Jiminy, is that ever a turn? So, which point do you think is the true turn in this sonnet? The turn from straight dialogue to metaphor at the end of the first eight lines? Or the turn from talk of parting and death and finality to talk of hope and possibility right before the final couplet? on death's door almost, right, at the 11th hour. It, it probably shows. I think the twist is way bigger at the end, before the final couplet. And so to be tedious for a minute and, and talk about formal rules, a sonnet that ends with a couplet and has its turn right before that couplet, that's an English sonnet. Gotta be an English sonnet. Uh, have a look at your diagram, see what I'm talking about. You'll also note that the rhyme scheme here in this poem is the progressive rhyme scheme of a Shakespearean sonnet. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, etc. So there it is. Michael Drayton's Since There's No Help, Come Let Us Kiss and Part. The most soul-wrenching heart wrecker of a Shakespearean breakup sonnet ever written. Grab a tissue. Drink some water and uh, track with me into the next poem. Milton. John Milton was a powerhouse writer of, of the Restoration slash 18th century. Um, but we're taking a sneak preview of him now as we work through the sonnet. Because like Shakespeare and Edmund Spencer, Milton actually gets his own label sonnet form. The Miltonic sonnet adopts the rhyme and structural schemes of an Italian sonnet, meaning we're working with an octave and a sestet, rhyme scheme A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, E, C, D, E, or variants of that, C, D, C, C, D, D. The sestet is sort of the most flexible part of Italian form. Two distinguishing traits of the Miltonic sonnet, though, besides the fact that they're all written by John Milton, um, are the fact that his sentences sometimes even often end in the middle of a line, a poetic line. That's called enjambment, 
do look it up when you get a minute. Um, second distinguishing feature, Milton's subject matter is usually pretty highbrow, um, high religious or political material, mostly religious. So today we're looking at his Sonnet 19 called When I Consider How My Light Is Spent. Um, one background biographical detail you should know is that Milton was a very, very prolific writer throughout his lifetime, but as he aged, he began to lose his vision, his, his sight, his light. Um, by the time he was just 43, he was fully blind in, in both eyes. Matter of fact, one of uh, the late major works by John Milton was an epic poem called Samson Agonistes, which recounts uh, the, Sam the story of Samson from the Bible. And that epic poem begins, its, its opening scene comes up with Samson already blind, being led by the hand. And you can really, you can see how Milton himself, having been a, a real literary force of nature in his day, feels empathy with Samson, this heroic, strong man who has been reduced to the vulnerability of blindness and, and needing to be led about like a child. Those themes of struggle with the grief and frustration of losing his sight, that's what Milton is working through here. And as a matter of fact, many, many people have found the sonnet particularly useful for working through some of the biggest, baddest, hardest, scariest themes out there precisely because it's so strict. Its lyricism lends it to matters of the heart and of passion, but its restrictiveness, its, its very tight demanding rules, give poets a kind of safe, contained space in which to try and work through these otherwise enormously overwhelming feelings and questions about life, death, love, God. These are the kinds of things that when, when it's just, when it's too big here, you put it in the little box of a sonnet and you work on it, work on it, work on it. And then you end up with masterworks like John Donne's Holy Sonnets, Michael Drayton, this sonnet that we're about to, to see here. When I consider how my light is spent Ere half my days in this dark world and wide, And that one talent which is death to hide Lodged with me useless, Though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker And present my true account, Lest he returning chide. Doth God exact day labor, light denied, I fondly ask? But patience, to prevent that murmur, soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly. Thousands at his bidding speed and post o'er land and ocean without rest. They also serve, who only stand and wait. So, first chunk, when I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker, and present my true account, lest he returning chide. Milton's use of enjambment means you really have to keep a careful eye on the punctuation in order to keep track of the ideas here, because they don't take the same natural shape as the poetic lines. They push through and outrun the length of the lines. It almost reflects the way Milton is trying to express this feeling that his spirit, his, his inner ability and, and drive and desire, outruns and spills over his physical capacities, his bodily limits like the structural limits of the poem, are too confining. Now that he's blind, he feels hampered and penned in and, and unable to express to their full and natural extent the ideas and the beauty inside him. 
Um, note also the allusion here to the parable of the talents from the Bible and the man who was given one talent, right? One gets 10, one gets five, and one guy gets just one talent. And that man in the Bible, he goes and buries his one talent because he's afraid, oh my God, if I lose this, my master's going to kill me. He buries it in the dark, in the ground. And then when the master returns, he scolds him, he chides him. He says, well, why didn't you go invest it and make, make more money for me? That's what I gave it to you for, was, was to invest, to use this talent and to multiply it. So same thing Milton is talking about here, hence the capital T on talent. And that one talent, his writing prowess, which is death to hide. It, it, it's just almost like death to his soul, not to write. And yet here it is, buried in the dark. He feels like it's buried and useless now that he's blind. Even though my soul is more bent on using it to serve my maker than it's ever been, I'm, I'm more driven than I've ever been. I want to present my true account, lest my master should return and, and find me at fault. Doth God exact day labor, light denied, I fondly ask? Meaning, if God takes away the sun, does he still ask his day laborers in the field to do what they would normally do with light in, in pitch blackness? Doth God exact day labor, light denied? I fondly ask. But patience, to prevent that murmur, soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. So where's the turn in this poem? Where does the thinking go from here to there? Milton is thinking about how much it sucks that he's blind and blind while he's still young and gifted and how hard it's going to be to do the thing he feels called to do now that he's disabled and he's worried that God might find him wanting somehow for failing to deliver on this, this talent that was entrusted with him. And then he thinks to himself, well, you know, God would be kind of a jerk if he took away someone's sight and didn't make any allowances. But, that word is right there in the poem, but, and it sounds like a turning point. His patience and his better judgment soon remind him that God doesn't need any of Milton's talents. Milton has only ever offered up to God what was already God's. The true servant of God concentrates on the imitation of God or, or of Christ, you know, Christ-likeness. In learning the mildness and humility of Christ, Milton sees he might learn how to bear his disability with grace. Milton goes on rehearsing the nature and greatness of God. His state is kingly. He has thousands of servants to go racing overseas to serve him in far-off lands if he wants that. They also serve, Milton concludes, who only stand and wait. If all a person does is stand in attendance waiting to be commanded, they are serving. So we have a big chunk at the top full of grieving over loss, and then a, a big chunk at the bottom where Milton reminds himself what kind of God he really serves and what his duties are truly are as a servant of God. So where's the turn? It's that but, isn't it, in the middle of the eighth line, right smack dab in the middle of the eighth line. If you check on the rhyme scheme, you'll notice the poem starts out A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. So here we find that the turn comes at the end of that octave. So you, look at us. Sure enough, this is Italian sonnet form, as promised. You see this on an exam. The author is not labeled. You, you don't quite remember that it's Milton. But you're a super keener, and you want to nail down exactly what kind of sonnet this is. Well, maybe you remember the story about Milton being blind, and you go, Oh, right, 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 this is that guy. Okay, Miltonic. Or maybe, nope, can't, can't think who wrote this at all. But maybe you notice that absolutely none of the sentences end at the natural line breaks. Not until the very end. 
what have I just done here? Yeah, not until the very end do line and grammatical sentence come to a peaceful and natural end together. That's enjambment. And a lot of it, it's, it's what we might call continuous enjambment. That's a pretty good clue as well that you're dealing with Milton, that and the, the religious theme. So, there you have it. Two more sonnets, fully unpacked. I really do hope these extra videos have been helpful to all of you, and most of all, I hope that you're having a good time with the poetry, that, that even if it's difficult, that some of the, the richness and the beauty is, is breaking on you. I hope that you have encountered poems this week that you felt a sudden identity with. You, you connected and you went, wow, that yes, that. Somebody wrote that down so well. Um, I also hope that you have a good time moving over into the worlds of rhetoric and drama uh, for our next class together. Take care.